Cheers. Cheers. Are you a morning person or an evening person? Are you, what's your favorite day of the week? Welcome to another conversation with the Apostate Sisters. I'm Patty and I make this podcast with my sister Nancy and we grew up in a doomsday cult called the Worldwide Church of God. We're also nerdy about history and culture, but critical of religion. So get ready to get mad or to nod your head in agreement as we embark on today's topic. I thought we'd do something a little bit different today to kind of close out our first season. Obviously, you and I are going to be taking a little bit of a break this summer. We've been doing a lot of recording. <laughs> it's been taking up a lot of time. Blue. It's a lot of work. Um, recording, editing, contacting people, and trying to keep up with connections. It's a lot. So we're going to take a little bit of a break. But I wanted to close out our season with something a little bit more fun. I think answering personal questions is very uncomfortable for people like you and I. And I thought, what better way to get over being uncomfortable than answering kind of more personal questions about ourselves? So what I did is I went online and I just got a bunch of random questions that I thought we could answer together so that people, well, they can get to know us a little bit more, um, who we are outside of our podcast. And we get to know ourselves a little bit more. But first off, real quick, we are going to be at the Baja Con come August 9th through 11th. It's a nonprofit of the Blue Water Atheists, Humanists, and Agnostics. So a number of different people are going to be speaking there. Seth Andrews is one of them, of the Thinking Atheists. So Will Forrest Valkai, who is a regular guest on shows like The Line and The Atheist Experience. He has his own channel as well. And also R and Ra. So quite a few people in the more humanist, secular atheist realm, the friendly atheist. He is also going to be there. He focuses a lot on separation of religion and government. Patty and I will be attending. We plan on reporting on what we learn, and we hope to see some friendly faces there. I'm looking forward to a sister trip with you, Nancy. It's a lighthearted topic today. I feel it. let's do something fun and relaxing. Yeah, might as well. We kind of get to know ourselves. So, <laughs> well, isn't that a good thing for us as former cult kids, right? The idea of talking about ourselves or knowing what we like and what we want. Yes. Uh, that's kind of kind of been a tough thing for us. So it's it's good we're doing this. It took me quite a few years to figure out things that I wanted or what type of person I was. So I think this has been very helpful. We can totally avoid the topic of the cult we were raised in and other religious organizations. It may come up, but I think we'll just focus on, you know, whatever answer first pops up in our heads. <laughs> It'll come up. There's no way we're getting through this without the cult stuff coming up. First off, what locations have you lived and where do you live now? Patty, you and I have a few of the same on this list. We both grew up in San Jose, California during the tech boom. We were right in the heart of Silicon Valley. And then how old were you when we moved away? Uh, I was 13. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you would old. have been 11. Those were um, interesting first few years. I mean, our father, I think, got laid off at his job with MeasureX or the, the paper company he worked for, which is now in the location of what is Apple Corporation. So our mother's from Los Angeles, our father's from rural Wisconsin, and so that's where we moved next. We moved out to rural Wisconsin and on a farmhouse, and we lived out our teenage years there. And a lot of our relatives live in Wisconsin, and so that kind of felt like home for a while, and I even lived there as an adult. Leaving our family home, I went from there to college. Gosh, I guess I moved around kind of a lot there because our folks moved down to South Carolina while I was in college. But then right after, I moved to Minneapolis. Now, that was right after 9-11. I moved to Minneapolis uh, for my mm -hmm. first career job and stayed in Minneapolis until until 10 years ago. And then 10 years ago, I moved out here to Oregon, uh, where I live now in Portland, Oregon. You and I lived in Minneapolis for quite a few years around the same time. I went up there not long after you had moved up there, right? I was just kind of floating around Wisconsin. I lived in Fond du Lac, I know, for a bit. Fondle my sack, Wisconsin, I call it. <laughs> <laughs> 
But yeah, I went up to Minneapolis, I started college, and then I joined the military. So the whole of my military experience, all those 10 years, I lived in Minneapolis. I was mostly National Guard, and then I was active for a few years. I deployed to Iraq, so I did live there for a year. I lived in Davenport, Iowa for a couple years. And so I was doing like a back and forth because I was stationed at the Rock Island Arsenal in Illinois. I was just right over the border from Illinois. And then uh, towards the end of my military career, I met Suman, now my husband, and we ended up moving down to Madison, where he lived at the time. He was commuting to go to college in Minneapolis, so he would only go up there on weekends. And then I ended up moving down to Madison. We opened an Indian restaurant together and had that open for a few years. And then right before COVID hit, we went to India, lived there for a year, not necessarily meaning to stay that long, but uh, the one month trip turned into one year due to COVID starting. And so it took us a while to get back, but we did live in Madison for a little while. And then after that, we're like, well, where do we want to, where do we want to move to? We started just traveling around, checking out different states. And eventually we landed on central Illinois, the Champaign-Urbana area, which is a couple hours outside of Chicago, where we have a couple cousins since they both lived here. And I found a, a house that I absolutely loved. And so this is where I'm at. I don't necessarily say I live here. I just say that we own property and we tend to <laughs> travel more often than anything. It's funny. I always thought after our time in Wisconsin, I thought I would end up in a rural living situation again. Like I really thought that was going to be what I wanted. But as I got older, I'm like, oh, no, the city actually has all the things to do. So I'm a city girl now. Interesting, because I am very much a rural girl. I mean, I like to be close to a city. I don't want to be more than like an hour or two away from an international airport. But living right in a city? No, nope, nope, not for me. <laughs> My dream home would be like a cabin in the woods next to a lake or something. Oh, yeah. yeah. I don't know why. I always thought I would be that. But yeah, now that I'm in the city, I'm like, yeah, take the bus, get to go walking everywhere I want to go, go pick up ice cream from any number of amazing places in town like yeah I, 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 mean, I guess I'm I'm a little spoiled by my city honestly <laughs> <laughs> that's fine you like your urban environment I, I tend do. to just make everything at home it's very rare that I go out to eat what is the best piece of advice you've ever been given best piece of advice not that I necessarily listen to it but there was a movie a while back that we saw when we were younger it was called now and then and Brendan Fraser's character He's like just getting back from the Vietnam War, right? And one of the girls that he meets, there's four of these girls, right? One of them says to him, you're a hippie, aren't you? And he's like, oh, yeah, yeah. Negative connotations associated with uh, hippies in her mind. And she says, my mother says all hippies are sex fiends or something like that. <laughs> and Brendan Fraser's character goes, I'm going to tell you something that I wish, you know, people had told me when I was your age. Your parents aren't always right. Ooh. And then one of the other girls goes, no shit. I can tell you something that I wish somebody told me when I was your age. Oh, and what's that? Your parents aren't always right. No shit. That statement kind of hit home for me. It wasn't really advice towards me, but it was something from a movie that kind of made me think. I'm like, yeah, true. I always thought my parents were right. Like I thought adults had their shit together and they knew the answers to everything. I had no idea they didn't. I agree with you that it it is like that or it was like that. And I've never been that kind of an adult. Like I got to be an adult and I was like, oh, I thought I was supposed to know everything by now. Right? I thought adults had the answers to everything. What is this shit? We still, we know far less than we did as kids, I think. <laughs> like what the hell are we talking about? Um, I don't know. Do you have any advice that someone gave you? I had more advice that I wish I had listened to. Like, Older men in the military would always tell me about making sure you invest in your 401k or um, <clears throat> into your retirement, because that's just something I wasn't thinking about when I was younger. I was kind of, I mean, you can only do so much, you know, to plan for your future. But yeah, it's nice when you're putting money into your 401k and you have a, a job that will literally match it. Amazing. So, but again, we don't think about those things necessarily when we're younger. We take it a day at a time. Anything I would classify as advice that I have found valuable was probably in the realm of parenting. The phrase that I heard along the way was, the words you say to your children become their inner voice. 
Yeah. Right. I, I mean, fuck. Yeah. So I, I think there is maybe nothing that has done more in my life to um, direct how I was going to parent mm -hmm. and to give me insight into why I am the way I am because of how I was parented. Wow. I mean, that's fucking deep. <laughs> yeah. Like I know we want this to be all lighthearted and fun and stuff, but like that makes a huge difference. I I feel so thankful that I came across that idea while my children were young. We had a mother that would say things to us like, um, because I said so. No explanation for anything else is just you're going to do something because I said so. That was the advice we were given. <laughs> like, it's not advice. It's just uh, control. So if all of my words towards my kids were things I expected them to hear and obey, and then I praised their obedient behavior. Like, uh, I, I, that, wasn't, that wasn't what I wanted to stick with them for their life. I wanted them to know their inherent value and know that they could do hard things. Praise their obedient behavior. That's terrible. But <laughs> really good way to put it, Pat. I remember having a play date with a friend. Like she brought her little guy over when I had a toddler too. And... And I remember something where, you know, she told him to do something. He did it. And then, yay, Justin obeyed. Eh. <laughs> Literally so. used the term obeyed. Yes. <laughs> they were involved in um, evangelical Christian church. So those things were, it's that, it's that sense of, you know, obeyed could be a really good thing to some people and to other people feel like a, like a hand around their neck. All right, Pats. Next question. What is your favorite type of music? I love the mamas and the papas. 1968 yes. would have been my year if I had uh, if I'd been alive then. Mamas and the papas. We used to listen it to as kids on our road yes. trips. We'd be listening to them and Elvis Presley. <laughs> yeah, that's where I fell in love with the mamas and the papas. It was it was like a, a family cross country road trip where uh, we stopped and got, you know, gas station cassette tapes and uh and greatest hits of the mamas and the papas was one of them and i fucking love it yeah you know? i would have to agree with that if i thought about it a little harder i could narrow it down to something like that too good answer so i would add to that as well otherwise i normally tell people um i like hard rock extra hard <laughs> Really? <laughs> that makes sense. Yes. My husband's like, that doesn't even seem like you. I'm over here like headbanging music all the way. Give me, give me Rob Zombie. Give me Metallica. What? <laughs> Are you serious? I did yes. not know this about you. I love really? It. Since um, when? I always, I think. <laughs> rebellious what? music. Just like, I love the hard stuff. I like cover bands for sure. Like on YouTube, I like seeing that sort of talent, the people that take control of their own musical career. Like Dan Vask. He's one of my favorite like rock singers ever. He's amazing. He does this rendition of Mulan that is just incredible. He does one of Titanic. Like he takes regular songs and he just, he, he rocks them out. Him and, uh, <laughs> Violet Orlandi, I like her as well. She does a rendition of Nirvana's Smells Like Teen Spirit that's really good. And she has done some collaboration with Dan Bass. But people like that, yeah, type of music. So I haven't even heard of that, Nance. Well, let me introduce you. Lately, I have gotten into Ghost and Coldplay. My friend loves Coldplay so much. <laughs> okay, Nancy, what is your favorite book? I don't know if I could even narrow it down. But since we recently did the interview with Kara Reynolds, I would say her book Priestess is definitely like a favorite of mine right now. I love it. I do love fantasy. Um, anything by Janine Frost. I also like she creates these worlds with like vampires and ghouls and ghosts. And I'm kind of into the kind of into the cryptid thing. But I've really I'm pretty open when it comes to books. I'm discovering something about this list, Nancy. I'm yes. realizing this list of questions is written by the sister that doesn't have kids. Because <laughs> I'm looking at this list like these all look like really cool things to be interested uh, in. If I haven't had children <laughs> for the last 15 years stopping me from engaging in any and all uh, <laughs> popular culture things. 
<laughs> okay, fine. Then you can answer them from the perspective of like, if you had more time in your schedule. <laughs> Maybe I'll just tell you what my kids' favorite things are. <laughs> See, Patty, maybe this is why you're a little uncomfortable to answer these questions. You can focus on you from time to time and see, figure yourself out, get to know yourself, what you like to do. I'm working on that. I'm definitely working on that. Good, good. Um, But I do think, though, hmm. that because of our upbringing it's actually a little bit hard to hone in on this of like oh what's your favorite this or what do you like to do about that thing that's just for you exactly. it's actually difficult it's actually difficult to to decide those things because i i'm so used to just like well i don't know i'm going to just kind of go along with life and be happy cuz yes. that's what i'm supposed to do so like i yeah. have spent so little of my life trying to think of, well, what do I really like about this? What's my favorite that thing? So yeah. little time on that. And I'm also just kind of like, I just love all the things. And so whatever comes my way that day, that's my favorite thing that day. Some of these questions are a little bit too generic for me, Pat. It's like, like, I like yeah, questions that are very specific and like the odder, the better. But yeah, great. Oh, great. what's your favorite book, by the way? I didn't ask you. You know... It's been a while, honestly, since I've been able to fully read a book, like a fiction book. I think COVID um, broke me a little bit where I felt like yeah. I had to be totally present and like looking at the news constantly because I didn't want to like watch a movie or read a book and then like miss some big news. I mean, that's irrational, obviously, but that's kind of where I found myself. So it's been a while since I read a book, read a book, but I remember the last one I read, it was a while ago that really stood out as just like like I just like my heart and soul got involved in it was the time traveler's wife so fucking oh, good wow. it's like such an interesting thought experiment because obviously it's a thing that wouldn't really happen it's like a person that just kind of like disapparates into other time points in his own timeline um yeah so good though and just like the emotional drama of a, of a relationship happening while he does all this time traveling and stuff. Ooh, so good. Awesome. I've seen the movie, but yeah, I have not read the book. So I will add it to my list of 100 books that I have <laughs> to yet to read. Oh, uh, if only we all had more time, right? I feel like like I'm in Pride and Prejudice and be like, I love to read, but I just wish there was more time to. Actually, that's another book I loved, Pride and Prejudice. Pride and Prejudice, yeah. yeah. Well, it was, a, it was a slog. It was good, but it was a slog to get through that one because, like, the whole book is dialogue. And it's, like, yeah, okay, fancy 1800s dialogue or whenever that was. Um, I, yeah, let's historical see. historical fiction is a little difficult sometimes. Probably my favorite book of my life is Little Women. I read it oh. twice in the sixth grade. Three years ago, I took a road trip to Montana with the kids and we played Little Women on audio. Still loved listening to that book. That's a classic favorite. Mm -hmm. Very good. There's there's a line I often think about in um in that story where when Joe goes to sell her hair, like she cuts off her hair and sells it to be able to get Christmas presents for the family or something like that. And the little sister, after Joe pulls off her her hat to reveal her shorn hair. The little sister is like, Joe, you're one beauty. <laughs> and I, 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 in my negative moments about myself, I have a moment like that of like, am I really like making my prettiness ride on my hair here? <laughs> <laughs> like, am I all a sham if I cut off my hair? Would I be so ugly? <laughs> awesome, Pets. All right, Pets, next question. This one ought to be fun for us to answer. What is the nerdiest thing about you? Well, like that everybody else thinks is nerdy, but you find cool about yourself. I don't know. I mean. I don't know. I think nerdy things are cool all the time. Yeah. I mean. But the, the mainstream would think is totally nerdy. I love Star Trek Next Generation. Really? I mean, I watch it. I'm not like obsessed or I don't like. What? Um, yeah, I, I, know I love that. It. Yeah, it's one of my favorite things. We pull out like late 80s, early 90s Star Trek Next Generation and watch it. It's amazing. It's so bad. It's so bad. It's good. I had no idea. Yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, I would watch Xena all the time, which, you know, total slapstick. It is very cheesy once you, you watch it again. But in the 90s, it was like, it was the shit. That's all right. right. Total pop culture. But for a question like that, I'd probably go with my tardigrade themed bathroom. No one is cooler than me having a tardigrade themed bathroom. Who else does? Who does that? I've been on a little bit of a tardigrade kick lately. So I love tardigrades. <laughs> They're the I best. <laughs> <They're>, <laughs> I remember all these t-shirts talking about tardigrades and be like the world dominator and live tiny, die never. And they can live <laughs> through <laughs> boiling water and live in space and all this shit. They're amazing. Live, live like, tiny, like, die never. <laughs> <laughs> They're awesome. My husband says I like them because they look like they have a butthole on their face. I'm like, you're not wrong. I, yeah, yeah you know. Okay. Well, all right. You, you got my brain going with tardigrades. I'm a snake nerd. <laughs> I love snakes. Oh, yeah, yeah. You you have a snake. Mm -hmm. I do. I have a snake, but I've always loved snakes. Like, okay. Mm. Not just snakes, but like snails and especially toads and frogs. Like if, if we're out somewhere in the woods or whatever, <laughs> and I see a frog, I have to go try to catch it. I, I have to. I just, same thing. <laughs> Funny story. My husband has, he says it's not a fear. Okay. He doesn't have like this phobia of like toads and frogs, but he just says he doesn't like them. I saw a toad, a big fat ass ring a little toad outside of our front door and I snatched it and I you know he works from home so I go into his office and <laughs> he's like in the middle of a meeting or something and I stick this toad right in his face and he yells <laughs> at the top of his lungs and he jumps out of his chair <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> what a bitch <laughs> Oops. did you know he was afraid of it yeah he claims oh. he's not afraid I'm just like yes you are <laughs> oh my god nancy oh that's funny oh what a bitch of a wife <laughs> oh nah you know how to keep things interesting i got him i got him but he he tells me i'm weird because i'm afraid of spiders i don't like spiders and i will go and get him to kill that mofo as soon as i see one in our house he's like what's wrong with you i'm like you don't like frogs and toads. What's wrong with you? <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> yeah. It really is all about the spiders. Spiders are bad. Yeah. I have no problem with snakes. I love snakes, rats, mice, whatever, but spiders? No. Even centipedes in some cases. They're oh, centipedes are the worst. Almost broke my ankle the first time I saw a centipede. I tried to stomp that little fucker and I was so freaked out. I stomped so hard and I twisted my ankle. <laughs> I mean, okay, uh, Pats, I think there's a question in here about what's the dumbest way you've ever hurt yourself? <laughs> <laughs> Probably not the dumbest way I've hurt myself, to be honest. <laughs> See, this is fun. We got started on toads and <laughs> toads. Oh my god, we love toads. We love toads. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. Still on the toad. Have you ever seen? Have you ever seen a tomato frog? They're amazing. They look like flat, fat little little tomatoes. Like really? <laughs> <laughs> no, but have you seen the bird poop frogs? They look like a bird shit. What? <laughs> yes look them up they're amazing so like it's it's like a camouflage so just if there's a bunch of them on leaves or whatever it just looks like a pile of bird shit sitting there oh dude. <laughs> you're so right <laughs> the bird aren't they awesome <laughs> they're awesome i have not seen one of those <laughs> if you're ever up in minneapolis um snake discovery they they have a like a a zoo a reptile zoo up there and they have all kinds of things and that's where i saw the bird poop frogs <laughs> that's amazing yeah. i think i was at the st louis zoo when i saw the tomato frog it was just a big flat blob of red that looked like yeah kind of the color of a tomato it was <laughs> frogs are funny they are
Oh, I can't imagine being afraid of them. Okay, where were we? <laughs> Was it? Well, all right, Nancy. I know you to be a world traveler. So what are all the countries you've been to? And this one I have to think about. Okay, so before I was deployed in 08, 09, I had never been outside the country. But then all of a sudden I became addicted. So Kuwait was technically the first country I've ever been to outside the U.S. That was where we landed. First was a base in Kuwait. And then we hopped on a C-130 and did a combat landing into Iraq. Iraq I was in for a year and I actually did have some time to explore a little bit. I touch on that a little bit in my novel. But at that point, I did take my two-week leave, not back to the U.S., but I went to New Zealand. So I spent a couple weeks down there, and that was incredible. Incredible. Just, I went by myself. I mean, that was really something. <laughs> something tells me your most embarrassing story also happened there. Am I wrong about that, Nancy? Which one? Was that the one where I shit my pants? Yeah, that one. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I've done that more than once. I mean, <laughs> I, I always say that to become a real world traveler, you have to shit your pants at least once because when you're <laughs> come in contact with different waters and <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> okay, I'll tell the story. I I was staying at the Yapping House, which is this hostel in Mount Eden just outside of Auckland, and I wanted to climb up this dormant volcano that was pretty close to me. Well, first thing in the morning, I swung by the farmer's market for some fresh fruit <laughs> got a shitload of fresh fruit <laughs> a shitload is that what you really just said <laughs> a shitload, shitload? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well I, gr I grabbed a bunch because I was like oh I'm gonna sit on top and look out at the skyline of Auckland and have some like fresh fruit cherries apricots whatever and I start kind of started having to go to the bathroom as I was walking up, I didn't know how long it would take me, but I'm like, okay, there's got to be a, a toilet up there somewhere. Like, there wasn't. So like, okay, still just holding it. I'm like, okay, um, yeah, I, I, I can do this. So I wanted to enjoy myself up there, had my fresh fruit, just sit chilling up there. I'm like, no, I, I really have to go. So I kind of hurry down and I ended up getting lost. Like, where the fuck's my hostel? So I'm just walking amongst all these um, houses I was very much in a residential area. Even someone saw me walking past and, and asked me about my story. Somehow she knew I wasn't from Auckland, New Zealand, but she invited me inside. I'm like trying to be polite and like, she's invited me in for tea. That's so sweet of her. The people are very nice there, but I had to keep going. <laughs> Just I finally made it back to the hostel, but I was like a second or two too late. <laughs> And all hell broke loose. To make matters worse, it was a shared bathroom. So it was just like I had to wait for someone else to get it. Wait, you stopped at somebody's house for tea and you didn't use her shitter? No, she invited me inside. But I just wanted to get back to the hostel. I thought, oh my God, yeah, I could go into this woman's house. But oh my God, hell would break loose. And I'm like, I didn't want to go into her house. And then like, just <laughs> get everywhere. So... <laughs> All right. Well, so that I mean, happened I, early in your world travels. But Pats, I was already used to shit in my pants. I mean, we had this term <laughs> in Iraq. It was called Saddam soup. Like just the food, the water, whatever, just getting acquainted to being out in the desert. It just, you got the shits. You know, it was either like you were constipated over there or you got the shits. It was one or the other. So I did. <laughs> you said Saddam soup. Yes, I did. Okay, here's how I feel about that. <laughs> it goes by different terms depending on where you're at. In Iraq, it's like Saddam soup. I think if you go down to Mexico, it's Montezuma's revenge. If you go to India, it's the <laughs> deli belly. You're, you're bound to shit your pants at some point when you're traveling to other countries, drinking the different water, eating the different types of foods. That's pretty cool. So is that your advice to would-be world travelers is get ready. It's okay. You're going to shit your pants. Yeah, pretty okay. much. That's Just good. know where the bathrooms are. Know how to say, where's the bathroom in different language. Donde está el baño? Por favor. Rápido. 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 Necesito un baño, por favor. Rápido. <laughs> exactly. Yes. So. Tengo un problema. Okay. So I was in New Zealand. After I got back from the war, 
I just had this addiction to travel at that point. I'm like, oh my God, New Zealand was so amazing despite shitting myself. All right. So I took a trip immediately with um, our friend, the Becker character from my novel, the, the real woman. We went to England for some time, Scotland, Ireland, Northern Ireland. Scotland was a very close second for me to New Zealand in terms of like, it's amazing. Like the Scottish Highlands, ooh, incredible. And also spent a few days in Cali, Colombia, because our cousin got married there. So I've been to Colombia, Jamaica, I've been to many times just because that we have a friend that lives there in Montego Bay. So we've traveled around the whole island there. India, I've been to three times. Uh, the latest was for a year. Obviously, my husband's from there. My in-laws live there and a lot of our friends. Most recently, I went to, let's see, Istanbul, Turkey. That was an incredible trip. The thing that I found the most eye-opening about that is it's kind of like plastic surgery central. Like people get hair transplants there. They get boob jobs. They get lip injections. Like Istanbul is known for that. I thought that was really, really interesting. So did you notice that while you were there, the people of is Istanbul all looked very plumped? Some. I don't know if they were actually locals or just visiting because it's also a huge spot for tourism. Part of Istanbul is in Europe. Part of it is actually in Asia. So it, it's really kind of an interesting collection of different cultures there. Nice. Oh, and then at one point I took some Mayan excursion down to Mexico, Guatemala, Belize. Did some spelunking down there, and and we saw some human remains in the ATM cave, they call it. Been to also places like Puerto Rico, Canada. I'm sure I'm forgetting some, but um, yeah, I try to get out to new countries whenever I can. I want to see more of Europe, more of South America. My husband's dying to go to um, Antarctica. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> I say, let's go to Alaska first. We've been to probably most of the states in the U.S., but... Let's do that first. <laughs> well, I definitely haven't traveled as much as you have, Nance. But let's see. That's I don't I don't think I traveled outside the US until I was 25. And uh, it was after I was married and I did a missions trip. While oh. I was still <laughs> I know. It actually like was a a stepping stone on deconstructing. I went down to Argentina as part of a missions trip with the church, the evangelical church I was a part of at the time. And it it was good. I enjoyed it because I got to be like right in the city. You know, it mm -hmm. wasn't like at some sort of resort or something like I actually got to be among people who live there. So I went there, though, as a part of a group from my church intending to work on a like do some construction at a Christian college down there in Buenos Aires. And um, and it opened my eyes to a lot of like, what the heck are we doing with missions work? You know, because <laughs> <laughs> when I was down there, it was it was great. But what we're doing is we were like just helping other Christians. So I was like, where's this like doing good in the world thing that I had convinced myself must be a part of Christianity somewhere. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> but what happened when I was down there is we went out to, you know, help the street kids, which meant they invited the street kids in to listen to a sermon for however long, an hour, and then they would feed them. So come get indoctrination before I give you crappy food of Uncrustables and like Cheez-Its. And something, and, and this was on a trip where we were going out for steak and potatoes and flan and all the good things that Argentina had to offer. And like, I had a big moment about that. I had a big, like, I don't think this is doing good in the world. Mm -hmm. If you're going to feed crap like that to street kids only after you make them listen to your goddamn sermon. Yeah. Yeah. That, that put a little, a little crack in my, in my belief for sure. So it's like everything I did to try to like really be a good Christian, like go on a missions trip. And you it always at being a good Christian, Pat's good for you. I know, right? I was I... a shit one too. <laughs> <laughs> so I, yeah, I mean, I would love to do some more traveling, um, but that was my big one, my big first one out of the country. And then uh, I think the, well, no, just kidding. Wait a second. Oh, you know, you know what? I did like briefly drive into Canada. 
on a road trip with a friend. <laughs> it looks like Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like, well, yeah, I think I went up into Canada through Michigan and then just over to uh, Niagara Falls. So yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. So technically I was in Canada and then, <clears throat> and then December, 2019, I took the family to meet up with you in India and we Yay. were there for, for three weeks and came home the night that COVID was announced to the world. So we were just casually flying all over Southeast Asia while COVID was making its debut. So that's yes. fun. Yeah. I don't think I've been to any other countries other than that. And that's, that's okay. I fell in love with this world and I just, I've always wanted to see more of it and more of its people That's I've always had that bug. Well, you know, what's weird though, is I always thought I was a homebody. Well, I didn't like that kind of travel, but then it, at some point I did get into travel and more of it was within the U S but we started traveling quite a lot with the kids. Um, I think when my youngest was two. So right up until COVID, like literally we had made it to India when COVID hit. And so, yeah, we'd been to all kinds of different states and everything. I don't know. Yeah, you definitely have had the travel bug more. And I've always thought I would. Why are you looking at me like that? <laughs> Sorry, I'm thinking about the bird shit. Or, uh... <laughs> bird shit Sorry. frogs. I'm thinking about the bird shit frog. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at your face like, why Why do you have a shit on your laugh. face? <laughs> this is a thing Nancy does. <laughs> She'll just have something in her head and you can look over at her and she's like, got a funny <laughs> smile on her face. Or she'll just be sitting in the corner of the room and randomly giggle because she's thinking about how a bird moves funny or something. <laughs> Wasn't it stupid that I should have been laughing out loud? I think for so much of my life, you know, I had to hold those feelings in. So constantly I, I would feel like I would need to laugh when I kept it in. Because I, as a child, I somebody some kid was misbehaving and he did something really funny and I couldn't stop laughing, Pats. And I got in trouble for that. I got in trouble because I couldn't stop laughing. I thought the guy was funny. I'm like, what did I do wrong? The dude's fucking funny. Yeah, he, was, he did something he wasn't supposed to. And it doesn't mean it was any less funny. And maybe that kind of prevented me from like letting my laughter come out loud. That's so interesting that you say that because I realized at some point I got to college and something changed for me. I realized up until that point, all of my laughter, I had kept silent like I would do the shoulder mm -hmm. shake and I wouldn't yeah. actually make noise. And then somewhere in college, I was like, what the heck? I don't know if it was conscious or what, but I start when I laugh and still now when I laugh, it's head back, mouth open. And I just let it rip because I, life is too short to not laugh. If you've got no. something to laugh about, I mean, I fuck. But I can't even tell you how many times I got in trouble for laughing. And I think that really deterred me from doing it as an adult but now it's all no out. fun you're not allowed to have fun. you're not allowed to have fucking fun you have to Break obey fuck off all right <laughs> whose turn is it <laughs> next question all right pats here's a fun question next this is not the strangest thing you've ever had in your mouth it's the strangest thing you've eaten oh my god uh it's probably a good clarifying question because there's one thing you ate that i couldn't bring myself to eat do you remember what it was <laughs> oh i do nancy i remember we insisted i don't even know how we decided to do this but we decided to go to san francisco and eat stinky tofu and we found a place that had it but it was on the secret menu so we had to ask for the stinky tofu okay i have got to explain how this all went down because in theory, Literally. stinky tofu should be on your list of strangest things you've eaten, but you couldn't do it. Nope. nope. It was so stinky. So we ordered it. We just got the plain one. We're like, we've never had this before. We're not going to get a flavor. It's fine. <laughs> Let's clarify. But, it's fermented tofu. How bad yeah. can it be, right? Here's why I was interested in it. My husband has a friend um, who grew up in Hong Kong, and he talks about stinky tofu in Hong Kong where it was such a big deal because it's so smelly you could sm you could smell the vendor coming for blocks away <laughs> <laughs> right but like it made people excited <laughs> like in Hong Kong they'd be like oh my gosh I smell the stinky tofu everybody get ready here comes stinky tofu <gasps> right okay mm -hmm. so 
I knew this. I knew of stinky tofu. I knew it was definitely not a white people thing to appreciate. <laughs> <laughs> and so and so I was I wanted to try it. So we found that place with the secret menu. We got it on the table and I was like, "All right." And I ate a piece and I don't I think you got about to here and couldn't do it. I managed to get three pieces of stinky tofu in my mouth and down my gullet. Yep, Nancy, that exact face. So I was eating that stuff and watching your face as you couldn't even put a piece in your mouth. No. And then it was still sitting on the table and you just kept looking over at it with a disgusted look on your face and you couldn't. You And so you pushed it to the far corner of the table. <laughs> still wasn't enough. We put a napkin over it. It still wasn't enough. And so no. then eventually you were like, can you, excuse me, can you, can you take this off the table? <laughs> and you kept eating it. I'm like, what's wrong with you? And I normally have no problem eating stuff that's like weird, but that was like the worst smelling dumpster I had ever smelled. And it was on our plate. It was bad. Mm, oh. And I ate it. <laughs> well okay so you didn't eat stinky tofu but what what's the strangest thing you ate <laughs> yeah I can't I can't take credit for that because yeah it never made it in my mouth but I will say I have eaten live termites before so I I was on this excursion of like survival learning survival skills in the middle of the Mexican jungle I was I was drunk at the time. We had some shots of tequila before we did that, but they were teaching us so like how do you how do you get termites? How do you find them? How do you eat them? You open up, you know, an old log and there they are. <clears throat> Lick your finger, grab a bunch, and then you just, you know, have at it. And let me tell you, they taste exactly like carrots, Paz, which was really funny. They taste like carrots. And they're still alive when you eat them. Like wiggly? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you feel them wiggling in your mouth? No. No, I just got a very strong taste of carrots, but that's not the worst thing I've ever had in my mouth. Okay. I should clarify. And that's not the worst thing I've ever eaten. Okay. I, I'm <laughs> sorry. It's so bad. Okay. Technically I didn't eat this either. It never made it down my gullet. I have a friend from Cambodia and she hooked me up with some balut. That is a fucking duck fetus. That is the duck eggs that have like an embryo where a partially developed duck is inside. You want to talk about going beyond my limits of comfort? Balut was it. Yeah, it made it in my mouth, but it didn't make it very far because I felt the beak. I felt, Ooh, the, rake, I felt no. the feathers. It Yeah, it's soft enough to crunch into it, but my God, Pat, it's, it was... It was a texture thing. Like, no, I can't do it. Just give me an actual egg, please. Not not one with a partially developed duck. But it's a delicacy out there. And they're available at Asian grocery stores nearby. So you can get them, but... Isn't it funny that we eat eggs and think they're great? And we eat birds and think they're great? But, but partway? <laughs> halfway in between is like, <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> if we had grown up with it, maybe we, it would have been fine. I don't mind eating bugs. I wouldn't like do it Which on the regular ones? just for funsies, but I've eaten like, you know, like sour cream and onion dusted crickets and various bugs in cookies and things like that. It doesn't bother me. I'm all right with it. I mean, cricket flour, that's not that weird, but cockroach yeah. I'd never eat. Tarantula I'd never eat. I don't think people eat cockroaches and tarantulas. Yeah, they fucking do. Really? Never seen I mean, itching powder used to be made out of tarantula hairs. They'll have like tra crispy tarantulas on a stick, cockroaches. Oh, yeah. People love that shit. Uh, honestly, I think ecologically, it would be really smart of us to eat bugs. But like, like I, got, I, got, I, got. Like, I do. But then to eat them, I don't know. I've eaten them in such hidden ways. Like, I, I can feel proud of myself for doing that. But like to think of big old beetles on a stick that I'm just going to. I, I, I can't. I can't do that one. I mean, street food in China. I mean, you wouldn't even want to know. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, moving on. <laughs> I think it's your question next. Well, all right, Nancy. What's the strangest dream you've ever had? Strangest dream. Okay. I don't think I'm alone in saying this, but have you ever had those dreams where you're like 
literally having really graphic sex with somebody like you would never have sex with in real life. Yeah, I think I have had that. I okay. was very so it's disconcerted. Not just me? No, it was really disconcerting. Yeah, it was like like a older lady boss at my work. Ooh, a lady. Like, oh, Ooh. that is not not expected. <laughs> But it's weird because, like, in your dream, you're so into it and, and really, oh, my God, you can feel everything. You can see everything. And then you wake up, you're like, what the fuck? <laughs> it's like, why? Oh. I, think I think you have better dreams than I do. I wouldn't say I can I see wouldn't say feel better, everything. But yeah. Well, I mean, more engaging. Honestly, I have a hard time remembering my dreams at all. But I definitely don't yeah. think that I'm in there like fully feeling and it, like I'm experiencing it. I have a lot of dreams about tornadoes for some reason. Tornadoes. Really? And it might mean something. I don't know. But a lot of very destructive dreams about tornadoes. I mean, it could just be a fear or it could be a little bit of like sense of chaos or fear of chaos or something. You have one? I don't know. I feel like as an adult, my dreams just don't hang around very much they're so few and far between that I remember them but I do know as a kid I had those kinds of dreams that were so terrifying you'd wake up and you couldn't speak like you couldn't even yell for your parents you know um, like sleep paralysis that kind of stuff I mean I guess it must have been in that range right like I literally remember waking up and then being like ah, yeah mm -hmm. ah, ah. And like just not even being able to get sound out because I was just so terrified. Yeah. Um, but there was one when I was a kid where it was uh, the bad guy from Strawberry Shortcake, the villain that had like the big, long, curly mustache. <laughs> and in the dream, he was in our backyard and had taken each of our parents and like hung them on a hook on our fence. What? Yeah, not like through their body or anything gross, but like. Like, just so they were like, hey, help me. Weird. Yeah. I don't know. Is that that weird? I'm sure. Oh, I'm sure I've had weirder ones. Oh, no. I know one. I've got one. So this was this was right after I had my first baby. And mm -hmm. we were right in the middle of getting breastfeeding established, you know, right in those first few hours. So I think it was the first night that my baby was around. And I had this dream that there was like a pile of babies next to me, just like a waist high, just a pile, just stacked up a pile of babies. Mm -hmm. And it was my job to get milk into all those babies. And I was <laughs> like, I mean, I, I had a lot of mama stress about getting my baby fed, I think, at that point. Right. Because you're like, well, new yeah. At doing yeah. So I, in this dream, I've got this pile of babies and I'm like, oh my God, I have to get them fed. And so I was like picking them up, holding them here for a second, putting them to the side, get the next one. Okay. So yeah, I guess I that's I think, maybe a strange one. Understandable, but strange. I think you had a lot of fears, not, not really fears, but uh, concerns when you had your first child. I remember you, there was something going on with her throat with a thrush or whatever. And you were so hard on yourself. You're like, what kind of mother am I that I couldn't figure out what was going on? I'm like, Patty, you're a new mother. You had no idea what was going on. And you can only do so much. You, you had best intentions trying to figure out, you know, what was best for your children. And you still are. So those were hard years. Those were very hard years. Yeah. You think, oh, being a mother is this natural, normal thing. It should be easy. And then you realize like, oh, shit, this is hard. And oh, my God, now there's this other person that exists in the world that won't ever not exist. And I need to like always be here for that person. Like, whoa, becoming a parent is I, I, I don't know. Maybe some people do it and they're just like, yeah, this is normal and natural. And that's how we do. And to me, I'm like, oh, this was the hardest, most intense, most draining and invigorating thing I have ever done. Yeah. Because it I mattered so much to me because here I was responsible for this little person. Yeah. So mm -hmm. hence, hence a pile of babies in my brain that needed to be fed. <laughs> it means you really cared, Paz. Yeah. Yes. Oh, so now, interestingly enough, looking at the next question, it kind of ties into the previous one because I have had 
dreams about ghosts. In fact, my husband has woken me up in the middle of the night where I'm terrified. Ghosts, demons, whatever they are. But this next question is, um, have you ever had an encounter with something paranormal? The closest I've ever gotten to me personally thinking that something was paranormal or just, just kind of not of this world, of this realm. I had an apartment. I don't remember where it was, but something used to pull my hair in the middle of the night. And I know I wasn't dreaming. It definitely didn't feel like it, but I, I would be laying there and think something would pull my hair. And I'd wake up in the middle of the night and literally grab my head. I'm like, what keeps waking me? It kept waking me up, something. Um, to this day, I don't know what it was, but it did that pretty often. And I think mom told me uh, something that had happened to her that she thought was like either an angel or something, you know, of God. But she saw, you know, our our old house there in the country, the the big blue house in the back in the driveway. It was early in the morning. She saw an orb. OK, a lot of people in the paranormal realm say you'll see an orb before some sort of ghostly apparition manifests, correct? And she said this or this bright orb just kept moving slowly, like back and forth. And then it went, zoom, gone. Well, that's I've never kind of heard what they that. Do. She told me that story, but of course she equated it with something supernatural. I'm just like, that sounds like an alien to me or something. <laughs> I don't know. But those are the only ones that I remember. And I, I believe mom when she says something like that, but I think her interpretation of it might've been wrong. Sure. I mean- my personal thinking is that anything paranormal would have a reasonable explanation. Right. Yes. But orbs are actually quite common. You know, mm. a lot of people have recordings where there's an orb and then all of a sudden something manifests. I mean, you know, we, I watch a lot of like <laughs> ghost type video. I don't know. Have you ever had anything that kind of made you question like, well, what was that? You know, cupboards moving or anything? Well, I don't know that I have experienced anything that I would say is kind of like a ghost type thing. But when I was in the fourth grade, there was a Ouija board in the classroom that I was in. And the teacher apparently oh. didn't mind that a few of us kids were in the closet in the like coat room in the back mm -hmm. with the Ouija board. Um, and so we were doing the Ouija board thing. And I swear it was like a question would be asked. And in my head, I would know the answer. And then I'd be like, oh, my God, it's going to my answer. Now, I, I do think that's probably the idiomotor reflex, which is like tiny movements that we don't recognize are happening from us. Mm -hmm. um, however, <laughs> while we're doing the Ouija board, all of a sudden, the lights in that closet went out. Oh. And it was just poof just off both of them and the mm -hmm. switch was still on and we couldn't get it to go back <sighs> on after that i'm not saying it was something but it sure was a moment that made me go what next well question. next question all right nancy what do you really hate the smell of <laughs> <laughs> I mean, doesn't everyone's brains automatically go to a fart, right? Just right away by instinct. But I mean, okay, I'm going to try to get something a little bit more interesting than that. But I hate the smell of mothballs. Maybe some people are okay with it because it reminds them of grandma's house. But to me, mothballs are the nastiest smelling thing. Ever. That's it's what scary. I think. I love the smell of mothballs because I never, I, I know, I oh, never no. smelled them until we were at grandma's house in Wisconsin. No. It's nostalgic for you. It must be. But to me, it like burns my eyes. I, it, like it smells chemically. I, I hate the smell. I hate it. I would I also, rather sniff a fart than smell a <laughs> I also love the smell of chlorinated pools. Is that bad? <laughs> mm -hmm. No. Chlorinated pools does kind of trigger for me like vacation. So I think that's perfectly True. fine. I don't know. I'm okay with like bus exhaust too. But yeah, just mothballs. Nope. I've known the people who love the smell of bus exhaust, and I think that's terrifying. What do you not like the smell of, Pat? <laughs> okay. I remember in the first grade, now we grew up in the city in San Jose, but in the first grade, I got to go on a trip out to a local farm there in California, 
and they had pigs in their barn. <gasps> okay, let me tell you, seven-year-old me had never smelled anything as bad as pig shit. And probably to this day, there is nothing worse than the smell of pig shit. <laughs> pig I mean, it's pretty bad. <laughs> oh, like I, I don't love cow shit, but having lived but in Wisconsin, horrible. when it's time to spread the manure, it's like, yeah, okay, it smell that dairy air is what we would always <laughs> say, right? And like, all right, that's cow shit, but pig shit. I mean, uh, oh, pig no, shit is a whole nother level. <laughs> it's a whole other thing. And I mean, I know we grew up uh, not eating pork, and I'm like, well, yeah, I wouldn't. <laughs> they roll I smelled them first. I don't know that I'd want to eat it either. So, Nancy, have you had any life events that uh, altered your life in a negative way? I mean, we could we could go with the obvious one, the doomsday cult we were raised in, but. We know all about that, so I'll move on to something else. I would probably go with the car accident I was in in 2012. I was on active duty at the time. I was stationed um, at the Rock Island Arsenal in Illinois, living in Davenport, Iowa. Someone ran me off the road, and my SUV went crashing into a, um, a brick building, and it fucked me up pretty good. My whole right side was jacked. And so the whole front end of the SUV came forward. Um, I hit my head. Uh, my knee went back a little bit, so my hips went out of alignment. And only recently I found out that I had a couple ribs out of place, too, and a chiropractor fixed it for me. So because of that incident, I happened to be on active duty military at the time. And so the VA has been taking care of me. I am on disability for that, but I had to get out of the military because of mm -hmm. that incident. I could no longer, I, I was going to do my 20 years. I was going to go to retirement and then get out, but I had to and say medically retire early. So yeah, that that changed my life. Um, I'm grateful to the VA. They've always been good to me though. They've taken care of me. I know it's not always the case with, you know, military, not always the case, but they've, they've been good to me, but it, it was life altering for sure. It was a car accident that altered my life too. Um, only it wasn't, it wasn't me. Uh, it was my daughter, my younger daughter, when she was seven was hit by a car. And uh, thankfully, she is okay, um, like physically. But man, that event was like, it was like a meteorite hitting my family. That they still deal with. Yeah. 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 The emotional impact of that. It was like, you know, yes, she was okay. But the what ifs. Uh, still well, okay. Are... She's got a pretty gnarly, gnarly scar from that. Yeah. It could have been worse. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, it was like between her shoes and her backpack, it kept um, kept her head and her leg safe, mm -hmm. as safe as it could be in that in that accident. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, it affected all of us in the house. It was so intense and still still is. We're still working through the shit from that. That was a rough one, Pets. That was devastating to hear when it happened. And the fact the older sister saw it happened is still, I think, traumatizing her a lot. Just never know when these things come up. Yeah. So. Well, yeah, and, and but it's hard, right? Like this is these are the reasons we want to build our resilience and our understanding of trauma among all of us as people, because you know we, we you got to think about like all those people coming back from the world wars, mm -hmm. and if I know the impact on just my family from this one almost tragedy happening. Like, I cannot imagine the psyche of those thousands upon thousands of men returning from war after having seen all of that. Like, that is probably a way bigger impact on our country and who we are um, as as Americans together with each other, trying to do life and understand each other. Mm -hmm. The trauma of war is probably such a bigger thing than we give it credit for. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. PTSD is is very much saturated into our culture now and just become kind of the norm, you know. I've served with a lot of people that have it. Some people say even I have a little bit of it too. I'm not sure. knowing, 
but well because you still have some dreams and stuff yeah i have nightmares sometimes yeah about certain things but yeah we won't go there the next is what what is um a tv show that you really like to watch or you could broaden that to maybe a youtube channel or a podcast or something yeah i don't know that i really sit down and watch any tv because i don't have time for that but yeah. while I'm doing my more uh, my more menial tasks in the house, I do enjoy some YouTube channels. Mm -hmm. I don't know, probably mostly in the atheist realm. Apologia, Prophet of Zod, Godless Granny. Who else Aww. are my favorites? I know um, I love Godless yeah. Granny. But yeah, TV shows, YouTube channels. I mean, I, I'm a big Game of Thrones fan, you know, with the exception of the last two seasons, seven and eight. And I am watching the new one, The House of the Dragon at the moment, too. Again, I, I don't have a lot of time to watch TV either. That's that's a rare occasion, but I do like those more historical um, TV shows like, yeah, Vikings, The Tudors, things that are based off of historical events I, I enjoy. Um, and then, yeah, YouTubes, I just usually watch slash listen to something when I'm doing menial housework as well. If I'm making breakfast or something, I'll usually have something going like... Um, Sometimes I watch true crime. I really like Mr. Ballin. <laughs> this former former Navy SEAL dude who's now a storyteller. He um, advertises this like anything in the realm of strange, dark, and mysterious. And so he talks about true crime and things like that. Just, just very unusual stories. He's good. Danielle Christie. I, I like her stories as well. And then I also watch the atheist channels like The Line, Atheist Experience, and um, oh, Casper Sight. I can't forget him. He reviews paranormal videos. He talks about alien videos, cryptids, and anything just kind of strange and makes you question certain things. Like he'll even delve into glitches in the matrix and oh, what's that sound of trumpets in, in the air that sometimes people report hearing all over the world, you know? And he, he delves into that and he's really funny. He's a big fan of um, Jim Carrey, just like I am. So he's got kind of the same personality. I love his stuff. He, he's really good. But Again, it can kind of change with time, but that's kind of what I'm into right now. What pets do you have? None at the moment and probably won't for a while. With our lifestyle, it's just my husband and I, no kids, no pets. I don't think we could have pets right now, but throughout my whole life, I've owned pretty much every single type of pet there is. I've had a, a dog that I adopted from a shelter. I've had cats. I've had a lot of rodents, like every kind of rodent you can think of. <laughs> I've had, in fact, I was on this kick once where I was just getting a lot of like hairless rodents. So <laughs> yeah, I had like a hairless hamster, hairless gerbil, hairless rat with these, these huge balls. In fact, its whole body looked like just wrinkly balls. And with the hamster, it, you know, if you have the, um, you can see their their skin is kind of translucent. So they, when they'd stuff little nuts or whatever in their cheeks, you could see it. <laughs> the hairless ones. But my favorite pet ever was a chinchilla. I had this fluffy white chinchilla. They're the softest animals in the world, and they're just good pets. I mean, they're I think they're they're better than cats. Their their turds are like tiny little mice turds that don't stink. They're just clean animals, and they're they're friendly. They're great. Gr they're great pets. Well, let's see. My pets. I currently have a corn snake. She's a butter morph corn snake. So I got very creative and named her popcorn. Before my snake, I had Australian stick insects. I named them Chevron and Paisley. And uh, they're all <laughs> females. So in that in that species of bug, there are males, but the females can reproduce through parthenogenesis, meaning that they can just basically clone themselves. So here to keep these bugs in the house, I was, I was going and getting blackberry branches from our neighborhood, and that's what they would eat. And so I, I just thought this was hilarious to watch these bugs sit here and eat their way through blackberry branches only to poop out more bug eggs so they are just effectively you know <laughs> turning blackberry branches into new bugs I don't, it's magic i don't know <laughs> awesome <laughs> those things were cool i like i them. loved them i loved having them because they're so like creepy crawly but they like didn't bite you or anything we also have a hedgehog in the house right now yes a little fat guy a little fat guy all right nancy when you were a kid what did you think you would want to do when you grew up? 
Yep. That one is like <laughs> the most generic question we all got asked it ki as kids, wasn't it? And uh, I think the answer I always went to was an actress. I wanted to be in like movies, commercials, TV. And I think maybe I was just programmed because I grew up in California. Maybe. Well, I don't know. I mean, fame was definitely an important thing. Yeah. But it wasn't the fame aspect. I liked the art aspect of it. Like huh. I just wanted to be in that other world. And I, this kind of goes a little bit deep, but I feel like I just wanted to be other people. So, yeah. Oh, damn. Yeah. That yeah. does go deep, dude. <laughs> yeah. It's just mm -hmm. like, I can pretend to be somebody else and maybe just traumas from childhood push me into that. I'm like, I just want to pretend to be somebody else, please. So yeah, I never actually pursued it, but because I probably would have had we stayed in California, but we didn't, you know, rural Wisconsin is not exactly a happening place for, you know, auditions. I mean, also growing up with the television, it's like, we just prioritize the things that were on the TV. Well, what about you, Pats? What did you want to be when you grew up? Probably a lot of different things. But the one that stands out was about eight years old. I really wanted to be a fashion designer. I remember that you used to draw all your little sticks of, of women in dresses and all that. Yeah, you really, you were into it quite a while. Well, especially when I was sitting in church for the interminable services on Saturday mornings, I remember sitting there and drawing clothing that I was kind of like, I hope nobody looks you... over here because I think I was drawing things that were just like ever so slightly racy, you know, like I remember a pair of pants. Now, again, this was the 80s. I remember designing a pair of pants that the entire side of the leg was open and it was just bows across. Hot. Mm. Yeah, I know. Right. I definitely want to be a fashion designer. And then at some point there was a, a youth group a career day or something like that and yeah. I actually remember talking to a woman who was an interior designer and that is what I became yeah that's what you went to college for yeah although my earliest job choice was ballerina <laughs> I didn't know that hmm. oh. I think I was four they ask us what we want to be when we grow up when we don't know anything about the world yet it's so Set your career in place now, children, before you even know anything about yourself. So this is an interesting question. The next one, what's on your phone wallpaper? <laughs> I have a white collar lily on mine. I just looked and I have some sort of purplish swirly thing. Cool. All right, world traveler, Nancy, what's a very random word that you know in another language? Nandri. It means thank you in Tamil, which is primarily spoken in South India. Tamil Nadu. And you, I know you're pretty good at Spanish. Sí, yo hablo un poquito de español, pero mi palabra favorita, palabra favorito, sí, mi palabra favorito es mantequilla de cacahuete. Awesome. Thanks for sharing. Uh, we're going to Mexico again pretty soon. Why don't you come with us and translate? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I can do that. Six years of Spanish in school and I... Yeah. No, but give it... A few months down there and you would pick back up on it real quick I oh know. for sure i even get really good at it when i pick up duolingo for a while next question what place has always felt like home to you i guess the old house that grandma lived in oh <gasps> i was gonna say the exact same thing yes i mean it was our home for a little while we stayed with her when we moved from california to wisconsin for a while i don't know and and it smelled like mothballs it always made me like it Ew, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, there was definitely something about her house that I just kind of felt at peace there. I always liked being there and I would always go visit her whenever I had the chance. So it was a good place for playing cribbage. All right. Next question kind of goes into some things we were already talking about, but I can guarantee we can find some new ones. What is your most embarrassing moment? <laughs> See, okay. The one I'm going to tell about I don't actually feel like I should be that embarrassed about it anymore but at the time it was pretty bad so uh god if I told this story <sighs> so at age 16 uh it was coming up to Valentine's Day and I did not have a boyfriend and you know culturally I learned I'm supposed to be woeful 
about that. And so I decided to take <laughs> some pictures of myself um, to show everyone what they were missing, I guess. I was 16. It's to show everyone what they were missing? <laughs> I guess. So I uh, was very stupid and had one of the pictures at school because... You were proud of it. That's fine. I, I was. Apparently, I'm an well, exhibitionist. Um, so, yeah. I mean, I was wearing things, but not a lot. Uh, so, I had this at school. And throughout the day, I had my locker open. And someone, without me noticing, took the picture. Or it fell out or something. Oh, gosh. Um, yep. So, I had, by the end of the day, I found there was a teacher that had it and was safeguarding it. And I needed to go talk to him to get my picture back. Awkward. Very awkward. Very, very awkward. But I didn't know all of that story. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, uh-huh. Um, to his credit, this teacher, like, he clearly wanted me to come talk to him about it because he wanted to be sure that this wasn't like a boyfriend getting back at me. Oh, int- okay. Yes. So I was like, nope, it wasn't a boyfriend that took the picture. It was <clears throat> it was me with my female friend. We were just having fun. Sorry, I'm such a whore. I didn't say that well- part. I feel like we all did that. There's probably a lot of pictures of my tits floating around out there. I don't know how many times I got drunk and flashed random cameras. I don't know. <laughs> really? Yeah. That see that I didn't I'm not do. Embarrassed about, but you being 16, I mean, I can see that being embarrassing right as you're getting into your, you know, sexuality. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in some ways, thinking back about it, that was that was me trying to like own my own sexuality but then you were proud of it i yeah. was but all of my conditioning told me to be embarrassed of it good on honestly you, Pat. that is probably not the most embarrassing thing i've done but to save space pets it's only us watching <laughs> oh, yeah. no one else will see this great glad we're just having this conversation between us I would say nothing really embarrasses me anymore it, really nothing sometimes i feel like samantha from sex in the city where the girls are asking her, like, is there anything you would do that you wouldn't want a man to see you do? She's like, no. <laughs> oh, my God. But at the time, I do, I do have an embarrassing moment that wasn't, like, just me. It was other people seeing me do something. Okay, military training. I was in basic training in, in, at um, Fort Jackson, South Carolina. We're in the middle of training out in the field for days on end. Uh I have my period comes a little bit earlier than expected. I didn't exactly plan very well for that. So in the middle of doing an exercise, one of my male counterparts has to come up to me and say, "Uh, Sergeant, you you got a big blood stain on your (laughs) Oh, shit. (laughs) What do you do in a time like that? We still had a couple days out in the field and I, oh, fuck. So I cleverly like, I thought about it. Like, what do, what do I do? I'm not going to be getting back to the barracks anytime soon. So I sit my ass down into the sand, which the sand out there in South Carolina, there's some parts where it's a little bit um reddish sand. So I <laughs> doused my butt in sand to try to cover up what I could. I was like, I have no problem admitting that. I'm like, yeah. So got my goddamn period in the middle of military training. It happens. And so, yeah. But just the fact that one of my male counterparts, fellow soldiers, had to go and tell me about it. I wasn't a superior or anything, but he was so nice about it. I felt bad for him, actually. <laughs> He's just like, it's okay. It's really okay. I'm like, no, it's not okay. I got to fix this. Thanks for telling me. <laughs> he he looked like he felt so bad for me. Good on him for being able to talk to you. <laughs> it is what it is. It happens to female bodies. I know. I'm really not embarrassed about that one, actually. I just... <laughs> well and we already covered the shit your pants story so i, I know i think that one was better <laughs> <laughs> pats if you could meet any celebrity who would it be i'm pretty excited because i am going to get to meet a local celebrity here in portland uh, for my other podcast speaking truth to goodness in which i do some like climate and social activist work on the local level here in portland Uh, I have been interviewing city council and mayoral candidates for an upcoming election in November, and I just landed a mayoral candidate who is also Portland's most famous stripper. 
So I'm pretty oh. fucking excited to interview Leave Ostras. So, yeah. And I just, I love what she's bringing to the table and that she's not ashamed or thinking, oh, I'm a stripper. I don't belong in here. Like, no, she absolutely does belong in the political world. Good for her. Yeah. yeah it's great. Interviewing her. Mm -hmm. I'm excited to listen to that. I guess for mine, I'm going to be super boring and be like, I'd love to meet Lucy Lawless just because I loved the show Xena so much back in the day. Uh, she's very active in her community as well in New Zealand. Like she's really against whaling. And so she gets a little bit political too. So let's talk more injuries. What's the silliest way you've gotten injured? <laughs> okay, my husband would laugh about this one because he goes skydiving all the time and he gets injuries here and there, which understandable when you're doing things like skydiving, scuba diving, riding a one wheel. Yeah, you're going to get hurt, right? No, my dumb ass decides to go and break my fibula just by walking. <laughs> so here's what happened. We were on vacation. We were in Colorado Springs and I was walking my friend's dog. And in Colorado, a lot of the homes there don't actually have lawns. They have like pretty decent sized pebbles. Just They just have rocks in their lawn. Uh, well, a couple of these got on the sidewalk. I didn't see it. I wasn't used to them being there. And I just, I stepped on it wrong. I was about to cross the road and I stepped on it and it just, it just cracked my fibula. So I did my entire like summer road trip that year on a scooter. I had to go to the VA and get a scooter. So I'm literally going around the cobblestone roads in the French quarter of the New Orleans, riding a scooter and other places. So my silly injury uh, is probably just me being silly of not understanding my own body for a really long time. So <laughs> it turns out, <laughs> it turns out I have a, a ligament issue so my ligaments are like extra soft and stretchy, like more more than they ought to be. Um, so what that meant is as a kid, it was great fun because I was like, look, I can pull my shoulder out of joint. Look, oh, I can yeah. put my leg behind my head. Look, I can just go into the splits without even trying. Um, yeah, I probably shouldn't have done those things. So, um, so as I've gotten older, this has obviously caused more issues for me, my ligament issues. So I, during the pandemic, was having a living room dance party when it was my best friend's birthday on Zoom. I mean, mm -hmm. duh, that's what you do. So there I was dancing around my living room, having a good old time. And all of a sudden I felt like, <gasps> and snap. And my knee, my knee had opened sideways. And then snapped right back into place. Oh. So it hurt like hell, but didn't bruise, didn't break anything. Nothing was visible or even really swollen, but it hurt for months. Oh, that's... Because that ligament just was like, I can stretch. No, I can't. Yeah, yeah good no. times. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. I don't even know if I remember that happening. Ugh. I remember you being very limber though. Wow. You you really were. Yeah. You could do the yeah. splits problem. Yeah. So it turns out if you can just do the splits, you probably shouldn't and you should get your ligaments checked. <laughs> All right. Next question. What did other kids at school used to tease you about pets? I think I mostly got teased for glasses. Gotta love your spectacles these days. They look great. I know. I'm kind of into my spectacles these days. It's true. <laughs> I don't know. I had in school, I had ears that stuck straight out. Do you remember that? Kids used to tease me for like being an elephant, like they would be legit, like <laughs> straight out. I don't know. They were big. And so kids you... would call them either a monkey or elephant. Oh my God. I yeah, they're terrible. Kids were so mean. But it was really cute because you, when you were tiny, you had this like tiny little round head and the ears that were. <laughs> <laughs> they, were, they were straight out, right? Yeah. <laughs> when you were younger. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, this one is very important. I'm sure everyone wants to know what Disney princess we relate to the most. <laughs> How about you, Nancy? <laughs> I found that that question on a couple of different um, lists that I found online. So with me, I would go with Belle from Beauty and the Beast. She likes to read books uh, she's a dreamer and she's just not satisfied with a Monday. She always just wants more. She wants to branch out. I, I, I definitely relate to her the most. And you? Probably Ariel. 
Yeah. Everything from look at this stuff to part of your world. <laughs> <laughs> I like looking at stuff, you know, like I love going to like vintage shops, antique stores. Um, and then, you know, part of your world, like there she was in the in the sea, trapped by the ocean and had no legs <laughs> and uh, wished wished she could go beyond land. And I think that's a little bit how I felt. Um in the worldwide church of God. And I just, I just wanted to go be among the people. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's fucking deep. <laughs> I know. Bet you on land. They understand, but they don't reprimand their daughters. All right, Pats. Um, I know you're not as much into alcohol as I am, but what is your favorite alcoholic drink? Do I really have to pick a favorite alcoholic? Okay. All right. I can, I can, I can. All of the above? If I had to pick one, it would be gin and tonic. Oh, hey, I drink that a lot too. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I can handle an occasional gin and tonic, but not much else, to be honest. I find that gin and tonics are those drinks where I could drink it all night long and not wake up with a hangover. So I'm totally on board with that. Yeah. Nice. Light ice, but, extra long. <laughs> but you're you're not wrong. Alcohol is not, not usually my jam. I usually... uh find myself yeah. elsewhere yeah and i'm oh, not in i know yeah. i but also are you in a legal state i'm in a legal state yeah illinois is a legal state yes yeah, right. yeah you name it i probably drink it pats i'm a big fan of like any good heady red wine like uh cabernet or grenache um i think when suman and i travel we like to go to um like the local distilleries and breweries kind of Try all the local liquors and, and craft beers. So we, we love Kentucky bourbon. We go down to Kentucky quite a bit and we just like to experiment with the bourbon. So I definitely am not a big fan of scotch. That's not. Mm -mm. I think I like that little bit of sweetness in bourbon a lot better. Um, I especially don't like the smokiness in scotch. Just not really. That's not my favorite, but I'll drink it if that's the only thing available. <laughs> mm. So, um, I, I tend to, I tend to appreciate that my chosen substance doesn't, doesn't cause hangovers. So, so I get the occasional like wine headache, but it's not bad. Ooh, yeah. I can't do wine at all anymore. That actually does make me a little sad. There was a time I was not a wine snob, but I did enjoy wine like while cooking or with my dinner. And I, I can't anymore. It makes me get feeling yucky right away. Yeah. No, I, I, that I get, I was actually going to train to be a sommelier and I just never pursued that anymore. Okay. Nancy, how about this? What was either the weirdest or best gift you've ever been given? I'm going to say weirdest gift I ever gotten a Bible. Like it came from somebody that knew I would just not be into it. So that was kind of like, I don't know, a rude gift in a way, like, yeah, you're a sinner in need of a savior. Here you go. I'm like, yeah, I don't want your fucking Bible. And if I want one, I know where to get it. <laughs> I don't know. That one was just kind of weird. I'm like, I didn't think that was a gift at all. I think that was more of an insult and um, whatever you, however you want to say that. It was more oh, like a, a passive aggressive. Not from a yes, it, it felt passive aggressive to me. It didn't feel like a gift. It felt like, yeah, passive. As far as best gift. Okay, Pat, I remember... I don't know how this came about, but you didn't actually get me anything, which is fine. I think you and I had talked after a while. We're just like, like, don't get me anything for a birthday. I don't need anything. Same with Christmas. But then you decided that you wanted to get me something. And so you created a PowerPoint presentation that included me taking a trip to Spain. And it was like probably the most unique gift I've ever gotten from somebody. Like you literally... You went through each slide and you're like, okay, here was your trip over to Spain on this flight. And then you arrive in Milan or whatever the fuck. And then you go to see this painting, that painting, and then you travel over to this area and then you do this. And oh, by the way, here's a bunch of gifts that you bought for us. And that was like the coolest gift I've ever seen. And I still have it. That was so fun. I enjoyed that. <laughs> I like it when people put thought into gifts, like some gifts, you know, that people just didn't, didn't really put any thought into it. They don't know anything about you. And I'm not saying that that's terrible. It's just... Yeah, we should really give gifts 
for that person, not because we want to put our ideals or our beliefs or anything like that onto the other person. In a lot of ways, some gifts come off that way. You know, I'm just like, this is something that you want, not something I want. Right. You ever <laughs> right. Find that? right. I mean, and I tend to take more issue with gifts in general too. Like, yeah, like, okay. Not- yeah. I get it. Like birthday and Christmas. That's what we do. I, I, I just have a hard time getting myself fully on board with that. Like, okay. So we all have to go buy things for each other so that we all buy more things and we all have more shit in our houses like yeah is that, is that really the game we're playing i i don't know I, this is where i'm not sure how much is like leftover shit from worldwide and like the you know where there was hardly gifts given and not celebrating of birthdays and all of that jazz you know i, I don't know where the trauma ends and like my my personal brand of logic begins um yeah. but I, I love giving gifts when I happen upon something that I'm just like, oh my gosh, this person would really love that. Or if I see a need um, and a gift would help with that. But I realize that could be awkward too. If I'm like, oh, you must need this. You know what I'm saying? Like I, I love when I can give a gift when it just, it just pops up, right? Like, yeah. like I saw this, I thought of you and not like, yeah. here's my obligatory thing that I paid money for. It feels so disingenuous. I think. Well, yeah. And then we go around saying it's the thought that counts. Like, well, yeah. So let it be the thought that counts and not the obligation of it being December 25th. <laughs> I don't know. Right. Um, but have I gotten weird gifts? I'm sure I've gotten weird gifts and best gifts. Okay. So I literally remember back when we were hanging out with my husband's family and there was a rather large hoarding slash garage selling problem in that Mm -hmm. cohort. I remember being given a lot of things for the someday babies that I would have and things, you know, when I was like barely just married. And I, I, so there were times that I would come home with a gift and put it directly in my donate box by my front door. Like, sorry, you spent your money on it. Like, but it's the thought that counts, right? (laughs) No, I don't know. Sorry to be ungrateful, but like, I don't have space. I don't want that. So I don't, I guess this counts as a, as a weird gift. It was at least given a bit weirdly. So when I was getting married, I found out that my husband's mother had sewn a quilt for him when he was, I think, 15. Um, She hand stitched together this quilt, very nice quilt, very good job, uh, and had saved it. And he was 31 when we got married. So this quilt had been sitting around a long time waiting for his ass to get married. Uh, And she'd been waiting a long time for his ass to get married, too. Oh, geez. It was meant for, like, (laughs) when he got married? Oh, literally. This quilt was made almost decades before I came into his life. Yes. So this had, like, a whole lot of her needing to insert herself (laughs) into his future life. (laughs) Okay, so so this quilt that had been around for all those years was on display in the uh, in the big room at our wedding at our at our evangelical church. And she <laughs> thought it was completely appropriate to get up there with the mic and to tell everyone that she had made this quilt for her son. She had told me of its existence and that I had said, what if it doesn't match my decor? And she looked around the room thinking everyone was on her side and says, and I told her repaint. Really? She said, but she, she said this at the wedding. Do you not remember this? Okay. I remember bits and pieces of it. I just remember her being super Karen-y and snarky. She's the ultimate Karen here. Um, (laughs) Mother-in-law. Sorry, she is. Wow. I didn't, I didn't realize she had gone to that level. I just remember her being snarky about it. Uh, it, it it was her whole like mother of the mother of the groom speech in which she said that. And it blows my mind that she didn't catch at all the idea that maybe that looks like you're inserting yourself in your adult son's life too much. <laughs> well, that's one of many instances. Yes. Yeah. She was very thrilled about having made a blanket that would be on our on our marital bed. Cut the umbilical cord for fuck's sakes. Right? Exactly. What's up? Uh, So 
Uh, first of all, ew, on that story. <laughs> <laughs> I love that even my kid hears that story and is like, what the fuck? Yeah. Well, <laughs> so I had awkward. not heard that in, in oh, depth. I, I remember a little bit of it from the wedding, but hand sewing a quilt like 15 years before your wedding, like, ah, oh, my son's gonna fuck on this quilt when he's an adult. Like, seriously, what the hell? Yep, that's my niece right there. I'm proud. It's kind of like, I don't know. I don't want to knock any of the, you know, people out there that dream of their wedding day someday long before they even meet someone to marry, but then they know everything they want in their dress, the location and all this, who they're going to invite. I just, uh, I find something so cringy about it. I'm sorry. I, I just do. It just, it's, it's about you. It's not about the marriage. You're making it completely about you. <laughs> Because that is a decision for those two people. <laughs> and here they are thinking about all those details long before getting married. I, I don't know. I've just never, I never even had the notion that I was going to get married someday. Okay, like, fine, I, I guess. Yeah, meet the, meet the right person, I would. But I didn't sit around as a kid fantasizing about my wedding dress or shit like that. Maybe for yeah. the fact that I didn't think I'd grow up just like we talked about but okay whatever <laughs> but i think that happens so much more than we realize yeah yeah that i think girls for sure are conditioned to like to put all of their focus like every bit of their focus on their future partner and wedding and all of that right like mm -hmm. sometimes even more on the wedding than on like who the dude is and yeah. it does i've heard of this like this is not the only time i've heard this idea of some woman has everything figured out for her wedding and her future life, except for making some dude cram into that spot. Like, I know. that's so rude. It's so rude. Like, that's not a partnership even. It's not. No, it's a, it's about themselves. It's all about themselves. Yes. Right. It's like you've written your own little story and you're and you're just trying to, like, be the character in this story that you've written instead of, you know, actually living your life. All right, Nancy. I think I know what you're going to say, but what is your favorite comedian? George Carlin all the way. <laughs> He's not even really like a comedian. He's more of a philosopher. George Carlin, we shall never see his like again. I'm going to go a little more recent than George Carlin. I cannot get enough of Bo Burnham. He is absolutely my favorite comedian. He's like musician slash comedian. He's very he young. I think I know yeah. who that. Is. Yeah, so he he started on YouTube when he was like 14 years old, right at the very start of YouTube because he's just in his mm -hmm. early 30s now. And yep. he got famous from that cuz he is just amazing with his words, like his wordplay and puns that he can work in and things are just like dark and relevant. <laughs> So I have appreciated his work so much, like all of it throughout all the years. But during the pandemic, he did a Netflix special called Inside. And it was kind of like dealing with all the dark themes of depression and being inside during the pandemic and all of that. And oh my yeah. God, it was so good. All right, Pat, do you have a favorite conspiracy theory? Not necessarily one that you believe, but just one that you find the most interesting. I, I generally love conspiracy theories, actually. Like, mm -hmm. especially ones that are a little bit historically based. So things like about the Egyptian pyramids, I find so interesting. Um, even just the history of it, but all the conspiracies that have sprung up around, like, what the pyramids were used for and the yeah. things talking about what they did to actually build it, to get those blocks to move and everything. Um, yeah, like the idea that they had some sort of advanced technology or something or that the pyramids were used as batteries i find all of that super fascinating i'm right in the same realm actually i would take it a step further though into alien and ufo territory <laughs> not necessarily ancient aliens but i think that um if other life exists out there in the form of aliens and ufo spaceships all that type of shit roswell cover-ups and and that sort of stuff i think it is definitely time for our government to 
let us know about it. NASA keeps saying, no, they're, they're, they're not out there. Our parts of our government keeps saying, yeah, there's some UAPs or whatever the fuck they're calling it now phenomenon out there that we just simply don't know what it is. It might be, you know, testing technology we're we're not aware of yet, but yeah, I, I like all the alien conspiracy theories. It, it's fun to think about what countries might be covering up. Other countries have come out and said, yes, there are aliens that exist. And I think we're getting more and more stories coming out just because out of all the conspiracy theories, this one seems the most plausible to me. Yeah. I think that's true. I mean, I do think even scientific folks, did I say this yesterday? I said this yesterday. I think even people who work in like astrophysics and things like that will say that the chances that there is other intelligent life out there is a pretty high chance. Like, almost not possible that there wouldn't be some other intelligent life out there just because of how we see life develop and it like follows the patterns it follows literally because of like the molecular connections of atoms and stuff so it's like these things would happen elsewhere too what are three things that you're like currently super grateful for in your life well maybe it's kind of generic but i'll say my health and here's why I could just be thankful for that in general because I have been a rather healthy person over my life. But about five years ago, note the ligament issue I mentioned earlier, about five years ago, all of that kind of came to a head when my neck had huge problems and I found myself in so much pain and being so nearly debilitated that like I was telling my family I thought I was gonna have to have like a wheelchair or something like I, I mean I was I was just not doing well it was it was bad so I am thankful for the human body that has the ability to regenerate and um you know that my joints could find a new pattern and break through some of the the scarring that was in there and be able to um, not be in pain all the time anymore and yeah. have a lot less of those issues. So I am thankful for this human body and my health. Mm -hmm. Um, I am also thankful that we have had a global pandemic and are through it in theory now. Yeah. Um, uh, and here's why it's because, uh, my early childhood was all about doomsday, right? We were thinking doomsday is going to start. And every time something big and bad would happen in the news, our parents would be like, well, three and a half years now thinking that, you know, this was the final stretch before Jesus came to get us. And I'm pretty sure that if there was ever going to be something that would be a sure sign of the kickoff of the end of the world, a global pandemic, you know, would that's one of the four horsemen pretty much would be a pretty good one. And so I, I didn't believe that we were in the end times when the pandemic hit. But I think it definitely like brought up a bunch of my shit about it. And I went into a lot of like protective mode and stuff. And so the fact that that happened and it's done and the world didn't end mm -hmm. kind of makes me think, well, I guess we're good now, you know? And so it was a little bit of a a release. So I'm grateful for the freedom from the bullshit doomsday idea that I was <clears throat> raised with. And the third thing, I am just so grateful for the most supportive husband a woman could ask for. Oh, yes. He's wonderful, Pats. You did well. Yeah, you just never know how things could have turned out. Well, yeah. I mean, I he think so many women right. end up marrying men who are mean to them or controlling or yes. take them for granted and i've just been really lucky about that and and i just feel supported and like he wants me to be my best self i know it's hard to think uh sometimes how things could have turned out the things that we do take for granted yeah mm -hmm. i mean I, i'm with you on that i i was gonna say health first as well. Yeah. I think we all take our health for granted sometimes. You know, we come from a family where we really don't have any health issues, no cancer, no diabetes, nothing. I I really don't worry about anything other than, you know, I still have a lot of pain from my car accident. But um, I also am grateful to 
who I married too. We live a very good life. Like we, like we're on the same page with, with most things. And, and I wouldn't be able to do a lot of the things that I've done in my life without having him by my side, you know, like it just, we love to travel together and, and I don't know. I don't have any really major complaints in life, I guess. Um, I'm grateful for that. I, I have room to have clarity in my head from after, you know, I'm, I'm grateful we escaped Armstrongism, Pats. And I'm gl glad that we turned out the way that we did because it could have been so much worse. I could have gone to South Carolina with our parents and I would have had a completely different life than I do now. I, I doubt it would be anywhere near as good as it is, now. it is now. I found freedom and independence and that I'm very, I'm very grateful for. I want everyone to be happy because I feel happy. I know. I have, and I have the best big sister in the world. <laughs> Aww, thanks, Nance. And the most Aww. supportive, you know, I have you. Who's it going to go to? <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. Well, thanks for joining us for this slightly different episode of the Apostate Sisters. Nancy and I are going to take a break from recording for a few weeks here. So look for a bunch of clips coming to your feed and we'll see you back in September. Later. Bye. Like and subscribe. Like and subscribe. <laughs> I feel like we're still trying to jam it in here and it's hard. <laughs> That's what he said. Yep.